my name is Vanessa Proudman. I'm director of Spark Europe. And I'd, I'd like to introduce you to um, Dr. Glenda Cox, firstly. She's a senior lecturer in the Center for Innovation in Learning and Teaching at the University of Cape Town. Um, and her portf portfolio includes postgraduate teaching, curriculum change projects, open education, um, and staff development. She also holds the UNESCO chair in open education and social justice uh, between the years of 2021 and 2024. And she's very passionate about the role of open education in the changing world of higher education. So that makes this a very good place for her, I think, today. Um, um, Glenda is currently the, the principal investigator in the Digital Open Textbooks for Development Initiative, which we will be hearing about today. And her current research includes analyzing the role of open textbooks for social justice. Very much looking forward to hearing more from you. Um, and Bianca Masuku, welcome as well. Um, Bianca is a junior research fellow um, in that project and drives the research arm of the initiative uh, of the Open Textbooks for Development project. She's currently a PhD candidate in anthropology um, in Cape Town at the university there. She holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Anthropology and Psychology and a Master's in Social Anthropology from the University of Witwatersrand. <laughs> Sorry, I probably really <laughs> loved that one up. But, um, her work has revolved around gender, sexuality, youth and health with a great interest in how young people experience, interrogate and contribute to the worlds around them. And um, Bianca's doctoral work explores understandings um, in the town, but in the township of Kayelicha. Kayelicha. Yes. Space <laughs> Community Engagement Project. Um, and Bianca, your research background and um, varied research experiences really fuel your current interest in open education, open educational resources, open textbooks and social justice. And you also have a keen interest in the inclusion and recognition of student voices. Well, it sounds like um, we're going to be in for a treat for the next 45 minutes. Um, so um, all the way from South Africa, um, um, it's only an hour away though. Oh, we've still got some people in the waiting room. Let me see, just let those in. Um, I would like to give you, to the, give you the floor to uh, tell us about your uh, important work in open textbooks and uh, welcome again. Thank you. Over to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Great, lovely. Thank you for that welcome. Um, it's great to be here. Um, sorry that Paula is not here. Um, Bianca and I know her from several open education conferences in the past and have met her and she's just such a vibrant person. So we hope she's back on her feet soon and everything yeah, will hopefully move on for her. And hopefully we can do this again sometime. Very interesting community. I don't know much about this community, but um, we're always very excited to talk to people in the library. Um, and you'll see as we go through that the library plays a crucial role in the work that we do. Um, I'm going to just make the slide show. I think it'd be easier. Okay, so that's us. So we're going to tell a little bit of a story today about this project that we're involved in and, and really the lessons learned. So we won't get into too much of the sort of research and the theory, we'll touch on it, but we're going to try and give more of a sort of practical, Kind of what we did and and what came out of this project run through today. So the project, as Vanessa said, um, we called it the Digital Open Textbooks for Development Project, or DOT for D. <laughs> that was our our fond short name, and that's what we still refer to ourselves as being. So this project started in 2018, and it was funded by the Canadian IDRC, and it was it followed in the wake of a number of other open projects that have been run out of the University of Cape Town, out of our unit, that is a center for innovation in learning and teaching. 
So we support the entire university in, in all their teaching and learning projects. And I imagine, you know, most universities have a sort of similar kind of unit. Our focus is teaching and learning. Obviously, we do research as well, but our primary reason for going into open education resources um, was because of the teaching and learning aspect, not necessarily open access, where which traditionally fits very well into the library. Um, so we sort of started to kind of set up these projects and started to try and get this going at the University of Cape Town. So a number of different projects and, and this open textbook project we were particularly excited about because we could really see the usefulness um, for open textbooks in our environment. Um, we could see it globally, but from other examples, but we really thought it would be useful for us. And we're very happy to announce that it is now an institutionally funded initiative. So this is always, and we'll talk about funding as a sort of a thread that comes through all of this work. Um, it, it's always the case that there's soft funding and when the soft funding goes away, it's very difficult to keep the work up. And we've been very fortunate in that Bianca is now a full-time UCT staff member and our colleague, Michelle, who's also pictured there, um, who might be in the audience, I'm not quite sure, she said she would join, but I can't see, um, is also permanent. So now we have actual, and myself, we actually have three people at UCT who have part of their portfolios dedicated to open work. So that's been an amazing move forward. But as you can see, we've been busy with this since 2007. So I think it takes a long time. At the same time, I think we're at a tipping point. I think we're at a point now where um, this work is raised in its level and people are more aware of it, of its importance and, and the power of, of what openness and open textbooks can do. So if you're starting on this, I think it's going to go a lot quicker than the journey that we had to go through to kind of convince people of, of, the, of the use of, of open. So the project had three components. So um, the Canadian IDRC are very much research focused. Um, so the previous work we've done was all kind of research work. So we had a nice research partner, it's obviously Bianca's main baby, although she's involved in everything else. Um, then we were very fortunate enough to get some money to for grants for UCT academics to develop open textbooks. So this was very exciting for us because we needed that impetus and a bit of resourcing for people to get on with projects often case that they'd wanted to do for a long time. They just needed a bit of resourcing for it. And then advocacy. So uh, advocacy fits into everything that we do really, where we, we talk um, about our work, but we've it's also on this nice base of research. Um, and that often makes a good strong argument if you can back up your kind of open textbooks are fabulous, you know, oh, why? And we can actually say, you know, these are all the things we've been researching for several years now. Um, so those are the three aspects. Uh, we'll, we'll touch on a little of the, the research and the grants, not so much, but a little bit of advocacy at the end. So we'll try and sort of tell you the story. And as you can see from the diagram, they all fitted in together really nicely. Um, it's not, you know, there's no order to it. It's all kind of um, blended into each other. Um, one gives evidence for the other kind of thing. But the grants were very important, and Bianca is going to talk about that and, and the fantastic open textbooks that were created um, through that grant money and then what the work that we did subsequently. So, on, there we go. So our um, objective, which is, is still our objective, so now, you know, it's an initiative now and we're still... Um, really want to ultimately work towards this goal, which is about improving inclusion in South African higher education by addressing equitable access to relevant learning resources. So although a lot of the work has been UCT-based, University of Cape Town-based, we have also had a number of kind of um, open conversations where we've been speaking to other universities in South Africa and we're getting there to try and get a network going so we can all support each other. Um, so that's the sort of ultimate objective. And all of this work in our context specifically came through, um, came as a result 
um, to a certain extent of student protest where it was very clear that the curriculum had to be transformed, um, that um, students needed support for their fees. And so open textbooks seemed to be a, a great way of, of saving money for students. So it was kind of a, a really good timing with student pro protests in 2015 and 2016. Um, and globally kind of also seeing this kind of widening inequity that is that is currently in place, um, you know, before COVID and, and I think exacerbated recently with, with COVID and looking at the digital divide that still exists today. So it's, it, it's kind of embedded in, in quite a complex situation, um, but I think it's relevant globally. I mean, I think across conversations that I have with people um, across the world through the UNESCO chairs and so on, um, these are concerns that, that everybody has. It's, it's, you know, really need to think about solutions and, and ways of improving higher education. So I won't uh, get into social justice and a lot of depth. Um, we have a number of papers that we've written jointly around that topic. If anyone's interested in looking at a social justice lens and at the theory behind it. But essentially, this we, we draw on the work of Nancy Fraser. She's a feminist political theorist. And she talks about social justice as a concept that requires um, social arrangements that make it possible for everyone to participate equally. So we hear a lot about justice and social justice, and just higher education and so on. And we particularly like this definition as being where we can find a starting point. And Fraser provides us with quite a detailed framework to actually be able to analyze um, how injustice can be addressed. So economically, culturally, and politically. So that's just a little snapshot of something that's been really useful for us in, in approaching the role of an open textbook um, for social justice. Um, and the fact that we save students money, we can include local and, and relevant examples, and politically, we can now give voice to marginalized groups and students. So we can make this quite holistic argument about um, open textbooks. So just in terms of a, a definition, and this was something that we started out trying to explore because an open education, open textbook is a form of an open education resource. And we've always spoken about open education resources and it still is obviously still top of mind and still something that we're promoting, which is giving this example of an open textbook. And, and in the library, you will you know, certainly have lecturers who just want to share some course materials perhaps or oh, perfect. Um, yeah. where are you now? Um, perhaps a video or a podcast or something like that and um, those are all open education resources oh but yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah at the, give you my air code at the open textbook in its in its entirety uh, as a replacement for that traditional textbook that costs a lot of money and is not always relevant so Digital, freely available, open license, obviously important, but scaffolded around teaching and learning content um, or a course or a particular module. Of course, it has a exciting affordances for multimedia um, and other links to other content if necessary. Um, it can be published in various formats, also very useful. So it doesn't have to only be the sort of traditional PDF. It could be something that's more um, easily changed, uh, that can have different versions. It can be more fluid. So there are lots of different options in our context as well. So print is also important uh, for low bandwidth access strategy. So that's kind of a kind of the, some of the key points about um, an open textbook and why it's different from um, a traditional textbook. And then while we were kind of looking at the process of how these academics created their open textbooks, we saw how crucial it was for them to collaborate. And we saw how what the open textbook provided, the, 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 the authorship, quality assurance, and publishing of that provided an opportunity to be truly inclusive, whether it was um, colleagues or students. 
So that was uh, fantastic. Um, and then we also found that they, it's, it, they can be sustainable through the argument of thinking around social justice and why they're so important and why open textbooks are so important for things like curriculum update, curriculum change or transformation, depending on what terminology you would, would use. So that's the kind of a, the, the now much more detailed, not really a definition, but a list of features of open textbooks um, that, that could be useful when you start thinking about this. So what we looked at, so we, we started off with the social justice framework, which we have explained, and we started looking at a relationship between the two. How could we make an argument for open textbooks having a role for social justice? And while we were doing that, we also started looking at the, at the classrooms themselves where these academics were teaching and what they were observing in their classroom and why they felt so passionate about creating an open textbook because they could see how it could overcome some of these injustices. Um, and then we looked at, more recently now, the work we've been doing is looking at the role of colleagues and students as collaborators. So this whole kind of um, relationship between all these aspects going forward and backwards. And so we've done little, we've done connect, collection, connections all around, but we've done it through the voice of the open textbook authors themselves. So the work that's come out has all been their journeys that we've told, their stories that they've told. And that was exciting for us because we could see that they were all driven by social justice imperatives. When we interviewed them, we asked them, why did you do this? Um, and that intrinsic motivation is incredibly important. Uh, and that, that will be something that, you know, as libraries, when you, you're talking to interested academics, it, it's interesting to find out what the real driver is and, and, and why they're doing this. Um, and there has to be that intrinsic mo motivation um, and, and passion for this kind of thing. And so access, affordable access was, was a big issue, but also curriculum transformation, multilingualism um, came up in a couple of examples that we have where uh, key concepts were translated. Um, so we, in South Africa, we have a number of different languages that people speak smaller and bigger amounts. And so it's really useful when students come to university and, and English is maybe their second or third language um, to actually have some concepts translated. Localization in terms of local examples. Um, often uh, in, in the global South generally, certainly in South Africa, we end up with a textbook that is perhaps a marketing textbook, but has examples from McDonald's or from kind of you know, American institutions that don't really relate to us. So that kind of local examples and local case studies is quite powerful for students to actually Get this kind of sense of, of understanding the text and relating to the text a lot better. And then we also found that open textbooks also provided a platform for pedagogical innovation, where academics brought in students to co-create as part of their classroom practice. Um, and that was something that was also very exciting that happened. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Bianca now. Um, Bianca, I'll just move on your slide and just... I'll way. just, yeah, I'll let you know. Yeah. Thanks so much, Glenda. Um, so Dotfordy as a project has had a number of these um, research objectives throughout the course um, of the project running. And as part of this, it has worked with, I think you can actually jump to the next slide, Glenda. Right. Okay. You're not moving. <laughs> there we go. Yes. <laughs> um, and as part of this, it has worked with 11 UCT open textbook uh, initiatives through our grants program, as um, Glenda had mentioned earlier, to really explore how they transform content creation or co-creation and pursue social justice within their classroom contexts through the development of open textbooks. And so... As part of our methodology as a project, the design of our research activities and our instruments was informed by the project's social justice conceptual framework. And we were looking to surface the, the, the various barriers that academics faced in creating open textbooks. Um, also the barriers faced by students in accessing material um, 
the injustices that academics were grappling with in their classroom context, as Glenda has hinted to now, and the different ways in which they were kind of endeavoring to address these particular issues. Um, the project utilized a, a, a mixed method approach um, where we made use of a variety of research activities to generate data for the project. Um, and this included uh, things like conducting desktop reviews, in-depth interviews with key authors, uh, administering surveys, examining grant propos proposals and grant closure reports, and collecting implementation field notes throughout our process. And from this, we were able to initiate these, what I'm gonna call these different processes. Um, the first being a case study process with open textbook practitioners at UCT. Um, and we also then examined open textbook production at UCT. And we also worked to articulate collaborative open textbook models. And so although all our activities have mainly been focused on growing and contributing to this um, body of, of research around open textbooks and their production, we also have uh, equally been working to understand and to articulate the, the very practical steps around how to go about doing this kind of work. Um, next slide, Linda. So this slide here shows the cohort of academics that formed the sample for our study. And these were largely the grantees that were part of the Doherty Grants Program. As you can see here, these uh, authors that we worked with came from very different disciplines. They represented very different contexts. And they also presented varied levels of expertise in their fields. So some are, are as you can see here, um, associate professors, Others were just were, were senior lecturers. That's the role that they played. And we had an instant where we worked with a senior tutor as well. So we were getting some of that student experience being brought in as well, or authoring from a student perspective. And so through our different research activities with these authors, um, the Dofferty project has been able to engage with the varying approaches that authors used in the production of their open textbooks and the different degrees um, you can go back, Glenda, and the different degrees of success that they were able to achieve in their context. Um, is it clipped backwards, I think? Yeah, I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go back. Sorry. Oh, Do you need to go back? Or no, I'm going to go forward. Oh, well, I mean, yeah, now you've jumped forward a little. I just wanted to show the slide that that shows the different initiatives Oh, and the okay. kind of work that was produced, yeah. yeah. I'm gonna have to go back like this. To so that slide, yeah. Yes. So yeah, so this slide shows a few of the initiatives from our authors and the and the the different kind of disciplinary spread that we witnessed with within the work that we conducted. And I said earlier, um, a lot of the work, a lot of the projects have had managed to achieve different levels of success um, throughout us engaging with their projects. Um, but I'll unpack that a little more as we move on. Um, you can move on to the next one. So as part of this work, our case study process was initiated to um, mm -hmm. kind of examine how academics involved in open textbook authoring and uh, publication activity at UCT plan and implement and reflect on these activities. So in this work, we conducted in-depth conversations with five key authors or, or practitioners, I guess, from our cohort. And we engaged these authors in order to get an understanding of their work and what they were trying to achieve. But this process also served as a, a, a reflexive exercise for them to really think deeply about their motivations and drivers as, as Glenda pointed to earlier and to talk about the practices and the strategies that they use and how they're imagining open textbooks as part of their teaching strategies in their classrooms, addressing these particular injustices or these issues that they're witnessing take place in their spaces. So what we were seeing here is how the open, how open textbooks in general being understood and used as a very important tool in the classroom to address a range of issues and a range of injustices and how authors were using these resources to think about democratizing the teaching and learning process in their classroom, but also to think about democratizing the creation and the production of knowledge in these spaces as well. You can skip to the next one, Glenda. 
our next set of work, kind of building on from our case study process, um, focused on open textbook production. And here it was about gaining a, an understanding of the strategies, the actual strategies being used by open textbook authors to actually produce these important resources with the aim to surface and to articulate um, open textbook production and publishing models eventually. So the table in the slide shows a list of our grantees and the different uh, open textbook projects that they uh, started and the varied kinds of outputs that they were able to achieve within the grant period. Here we made use of a combination of qualitative and quantitative research activities to understand the trajectory of these initiatives. Um, I mentioned these earlier, we, we, had, we, we worked with grant proposals and the envisioned plan that they articulated in their proposals. We engaged with field notes that we captured, um, that were captured by our, by our implementation and uh, publishing manager in varying interactions, this is Michelle. Um, we worked with some survey data and grant closure reports that were submitted at the end of the grant period as well. So we, we worked with a lot of pieces of data, a lot of data sources to be able to kind of get to grips with what was happening in this work. And within this process, we were able then to, I'd say, identify key open textbook production activities that were being used by our authors. And these were namely authorship, quality assurance, and publishing. These are the three key ones that we kind of focused on throughout our process. And here we captured the nuances and the details in each of these initiatives production process. And it allowed us to be able to explore the textbook publishing landscape at GCT and the individuals who are kind of participating and moving around within that space and figuring things out. Um, next slide, Linda. And so as a, as a subset of this work, we compiled what we called open textbook journeys of this, uh, these, this cohort of academics. Um, because what we were seeing from earlier foundational work was that open textbook activity as, at UCT was very fragmented and expertise developed around open textbook production was really confined to these small pockets within the institution. So nothing was, con nothing was a consolidated effort. There was no coming together um, happening in, in the institutional space. Uh, what motivated this set of work was, was this imperative then to tell the stories of academics who are undertaking this work and to really profile them. Um, the journey's concept came from exploring the different kinds of aspects and components involved in, in these authors' conceptualization and the production and the publishing of open textbooks. And each of these journeys reflected these many different stages and components that emerged with each initiative. And so all of them started with this original plan, which was their articulation of what their open textbooks were going to be about and what particular issues they were trying to address. And from this point, depending on their motivations and the issues they wanted to get to, they made particular decisions around authorship, um, particular decisions around content development, how they wanted to involve students, the strategies around publishing, and the different tools that they, they wanted to make use of in that process as well. In some cases, things didn't go as planned in their journeys, um, this is expected. And in a few instances, authors kind of quit the process due to a lot of different reasons of things that happen in the background that we, we, we don't know about. Um, and so in, telling, in the telling of these stories, this collection that we've created here, this monograph that we've put together, um, captures these granular details of academics uh, endeavors as it relates to open textbook development, revealing their thoughts and their reflections as they kind of navigate um, these different aspects of the process. So despite the highs and the lows of the process, we, we kind of see the heroic efforts and, and I feel like it's just to call it that, it is quite heroic um, of these academics doing this kind of work with very limited funding or other institutional support. And we see this as a, as a testament of their desire to really improve the learning experience for their students. Um, so here we've put a link to the resource where you will see the, the, the bigger collection of the 11 initiatives that we worked with and the, the real details of what happens when someone decides to take on this kind of challenge. Um, next slide, Linda. Okay. 
And so lastly, as an extension of our case study process and, and an extension of this open textbook production process, the project worked towards, as I said earlier, surfacing and articulating open textbook production and publishing models that are being employed at UCT, that are being used at UCT, the things that we are seeing. The aim of this work was to provide open textbook creators with sustainable models of production that manifest this goal of uh, parity of participation, as Glenda had mentioned er earlier in, in that introduction about social justice, as the just end of social justice. And so we worked with the key open textbook, uh, the key um, production activities, sorry, identified in our um, open textbook production process. And we were able to reveal different forms of collaborative practices and approaches that were taking place with colleagues and with students. And we, and we were able to define four particular models within our particular, with our, within our project's context, sorry. And in this work here, we adapted Catherine Bovell's framework of inclusion, and we used it here as a, as a kind of analytical tool to understand these degrees of collaboration with both colleagues and students. Um, I have them listed there, the models that we created. On the one end, we have the participatory engagement model, and here we were seeing authors operate mostly as solo or lead authors with um, very little co collaboration happening with colleagues and some kind of participation in, uh, participation with students in their different activities. And this model is positioned as affirmative with less inclusion and collaboration with colleagues and students than all the other models that we developed. On the other end of the spectrum, we have the co-creation partnership model. And here we were seeing authors who worked as editors in chief or content development facilitators. These are the terms we came up with um, as we were venturing through this work um, with colleagues and students as authors or co-authors. And the strategies uh, used were those of partnership or co-creation in their different production activities. And so here authors were, were very innovative and um, did it disappear? <laughs> yeah, it did. <laughs> Just carry on. Okay. I'm not driving um, well today. <laughs> <laughs> Authors are using very uh, innovative and inclusive methods to kind of include the different voices in the textbook development process. Um, and so because of all this collaboration, this model, um, to reference some of Nancy Fraser's social justice work, as mentioned earlier by Glenda, um, this model promotes cultural recognition through the inclusion of multiple voices and, and representation of local knowledge. And it also addresses political misframing by offering a, a, a kind of balance of power in the authoring of textbooks, and therefore can kind of be classified as, as the most transformative of the four models that we developed. And so with these different degrees of collaboration taking place with colleagues and students, we saw these strategies um, or, or models, sorry, uh, or rather, existing on, on a kind of scale or a spectrum of sorts, hence the color coding we have used. Uh, I think you would have seen it in the previous slide, but you'll catch a bit of it in, in the graphs that I'm about to show here. So here's the color coding that we use there, where although all of the uh, models are collaborative, some mm -hmm. provide greater inclusivity for the production process. And so you can see in these graphs, each model encompasses I think you can go through all of them, or just so we can have a comparative picture. Yeah, um, each model encompasses different kinds of strategies and practices by authors around these key production activities, and these emerged as a result of open textbook authors grappling with the dynamics of of open textbook production. A lot of them, really, for the first time ever, um, and with the blue graph as you're seeing over here, showing a, a very little engagement and collaboration and the yellow graph showing a lot more co-creation with colleagues and a lot of emerging work with students. And we believe that although these, these models are all different in their strategies, they're all very useful uh, possible pathways for future authors um, to consider and to adopt. And just in conclusion here, um, as you can see, you can move to the next, um, there we go. And so in these models, when we paid closer attention to the role that students played in these production processes, we saw different kinds of collaborative uh, approaches being established. So in six of our initiatives, students uh, took on various 
co-creation roles in authorship, providing text, images, researching some of the components of the content. Um, in two initiatives, students were co-creators in quality assurance. So they were offering feedback and testing some of the content that was being produced. And so we saw how authors were finding these ways in which to not only capture students' lived realities um, in the authorship process, but also to kind of include their feedback and quality assurance. However, students were not very involved in any of the publishing work that took place. And we believe that this is because publishing is still a very new space and a new component of the production process that authors are still kind of trying to figure out for themselves as well. So what's highlighted in this regard is the fact that the, that student participation in open textbook production particularly is a very critical aspect of the institutional transformational agenda at UCT and that it's addressing um, uh, issues around social justice and the different kinds of inequities that exist in the classroom. So as you can see, I think I've been speaking quite a lot now, as you can see, we've done quite a lot of work to try and unpack um, open textbook production and understand the individuals that are actually taking on this challenge. And in our next set of work, uh, which Glenda will touch on a little later as well, we're planning to focus on the role that students can play in this big puzzle of, of things that are happening in, in terms of open textbook and, and open textbook production. So I'm going to hand over uh, again now to Glenda, who will now speak a little bit about our advocacy work. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to, I've just got a few more slides um, and then hopefully we can have some questions. Um, so when this work started at UCT, um, we had a change in deputy vice chancellor and a new deputy vice chancellor teaching and learning came in. And she really enjoyed this work and felt that it had an incredibly important role to play um, in, in all the work that we did. And in fact, she was on our committee where we decided who to give the grants to because we had a lot of applications um, and we had a criteria to work through them and she was actually in that committee. So she was really interested in it. And I sat in a committee, different committee meeting one day and she said, oh, we should have an award for an open textbook. So <laughs> that was a real victory for us and, and very, very exciting that actually there's this actual recognition. Um, we haven't put the 2023 winners up yet, um, but we do have two more winners this year. But we've been fortunate enough to support this for, for three years now. So, and it, it's, we've tried to make it, um, you know, it, it's part of an official process that is there's also an open, there's also a book award at UCT, as, as most universities would have a book award. And so there's the book award and there's the open textbook award. And it and it has quite a bit of gra gravitas. Um, and uh, yeah, it's announced across the institution and so on. So we're hoping that these lecturers actually feel some sense of recognition for their work. And they do get a very small amount of money as an actual kind of prize for this, for doing this, which is obviously always handy. Um, and so when we look at the deciding who should get the Open Textbook Award, um, we look at these features. Um, and so we have this rubric that we work on, but we do really look for curriculum transformation and decolonization, pedagogical innovation, including inclusion of students and marginalized voices, disability access, relevance to local contents, multilingualism, and collaboration and teamwork. So you can see these are threads that go through all the work that we do, where we, we're not, it's, uh, this is one of the things that we've been saying, and we see it quite clearly now. It is definitely about creating a piece of content. It is about creating an open resource, but it's about the process that seems to be the most powerful thing about it. It's what it can do while you're making it in terms of addressing is, issues of injustice um, and, and collaboration and working together. So we've got that. Then we also at UCT have an open UCT repository. So some libraries will have this. This is something that we started in our unit initially with Mellon funding, and then now it is housed in the library. So it's absolutely the right place for the library to be doing this. And as you can see, it's got these different sections where there's research um, dissertations, open education resources and other publications, which is also fantastic that UCT academics can share in any of these places openly. Um, so that's also something that 
you may have, and maybe at this stage you have um, more of an, a research or an open access repository. Um, and one way of thinking about it is to actually start thinking how you could actually have teaching materials there as well. Uh, we also have a UCT Press, which has just been kind of, I, 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 I want to say relaunched, um, went quiet for quite some time. Um, and then I think they weren't sure what the future would be, but now it seems to be back. Um, nothing, nothing happening there just yet. So it's very new. But so these are books, historical titles that you see here, but very much an open access focus. So another place possibly for open textbooks to be uh, published. And then just uh, the last couple of slides, what's next is to really look at the student experience. So um, we're going to be, uh, Bianca's already started interviewing students and we're going to do some focus groups and we want to understand what the students experienced in their co-creation and also we want to find out, you know, students who've been using these open textbooks, what, what they feel are the benefits or you know, what, where they think they could improve or yeah, any, any kind of feedback from students. Um, so this is, this is our next uh, challenge. And then, as I said, right in the very beginning, we're trying to uh, tie together all people that are interested in our environment um, and, and bring them together as sort of local and, and, and international and talk about a network um, in our area. And then I just wanted to end off quite quickly with um, recommendations and then hopefully there'll be some questions. Um, so I think Bianca and I both, as we've been talking, we've been kind of hinting at, you know, this is a good thing to try. This, this is, you know, a way of approaching it. Obviously different ways of approaching it and it depends on your context entirely. But one of the useful things that happened right in the beginning was to find out what's happening at your institution. You know, who are the champions in open education? Who has really created an open textbook? And, and it's sometimes it involves a lot of sleuthing because if you don't have a place where these things are recognized or acknowledged, they can be quite hidden in a website somewhere that can't easily be accessed. So really trying to find out what's happening at your institution and drawing out those those, those the people. Um, so you get a sense of, of where you are to start off with. Mm -hmm. Obviously funding, if you can find a little bits of funding, we've seen this internationally at other, like BC campus is one that comes to mind um, and Quantum uh, Polytechnic, where in Canada, where they have um, had small amounts of money to give to academics to develop these resources. So definitely if there's funding behind it, that, that does help. Um, the idea of, of uh, like, so for example, with Michelle Bianca and I, we all have, it's not our whole jobs, but it's a good part of our jobs that's involved with, with being open so that we can sustain it and keep it going all the time because it does need that, you know, constant attention. Mm -hmm. So then identifying champions existing and new, some of that might come from the landscape survey or some of it may come if you're doing a call to see who's interested in open education resources. The other thing we found with this, this key aspect around the collaboration and the process of open textbook production um, is that it really enables kind of colleagues and students to be involved. And, and what we saw was when individuals try to do this on their own, they were slightly less successful. And we only have a small group, so we don't like to generalize. That's the case always, and that might not always be the case. But certainly the examples where it didn't quite work out, there were people trying to do too much and were already overloaded. We know we are all overloaded and it's difficult to find this. But if you collaborate and you get students involved, mm -hmm. it just becomes more achievable. And then you know, if this can be tied into your institutional vision or mission or the library's mission, mission or vision, um, and you get some support higher up, um, that definitely does help. It took us a very long time to get to that point, as you saw, um, over 10 years before we actually really got someone who's said, um, we'll put money behind this and, and support you. Um, so it, it just depends who you have at the moment in your leadership. Mm -hmm. So I think that's that's about it from us. 
Thank you so much both um, for a really fascinating talk. And I mean, the approach, um, as you say, funding some of those champions to create textbooks and then translating that into some really practical um, outputs. And then also the, those wonderful case, case studies, the journeys. So also sharing the hows uh, very concretely. Um, and then you also, you think about the rewards uh, going forward for open education uh, and textbooks creation with that, with, uh, with the award. Um, so, I mean, there are all sorts of really great things in there, but um, I'd like to open the floor to any questions. Uh, we could maybe stop screen sharing and then we can see everybody. Um, so who has the first um, question? We've got 10 minutes, so don't be shy. I know a number of you are actually working in this area or thinking of working in this area. Yes, Marta, go ahead. Hello, and apologies for joining a bit late, but uh, I was fascinated <clears throat> by your talk because I can I can see so many common themes running through what you've talked about. And my question is, it's to do with creating that community of people who are interested in this. So have you used this, these projects as a way of profiling that community or <laughs> did you first have that community and then created these case studies or is it a bit of both um i think it's a little bit of both in that we did have a, i wouldn't say community but we certainly had a lot of people some key academics who were already sharing open education resources so mm -hmm. not as much textbooks for um, sort of scaffolded textbooks um, and there had been some profiling around those people um, sort of it's very successful out there academics who were doing really good work so that also helped in terms of kind of awareness in different departments in different places that this work was happening so there was definitely a bit of a an undercurrent of of this awareness but I would say this community that we've built now that we can draw on when we when, you know when we need someone to do advocacy came through this um joint experience of creating this open textbook and then subsequently we've had these bigger open conversation meetings where we've drawn them all in um so i think this actually brought it together because it was a project mm. that's really interesting because I, I think we all recognize this thing where there are, because universities are such complex institutions, there are different people doing things in their own mm -hmm. local uh, department or area or whatever, and nobody else knows about what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And it's actually trying to identify those people and bring them together. But how do you do that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's very, I, I, I understand completely. It, it is it is very difficult. Um, yeah. But definitely with the Open Textbook Award, with we have a teaching and learning conference, definitely teaching and learning conference, talking to other people that are super passionate about teaching and learning. So perhaps preaching to the converted already. Right. But uh, those people do tend, you know, we, we always encourage Open Textbook authors to present in that environment to share, the, share their journeys. Um, so it's it's a, it's not an easy process for sure. Mm. As well, you've definitely add... shown us something. <laughs> Sorry, Thank Bianca. You. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> I was just going to add to what Glenda is saying. I think our grants program actually also really um, added to that experience by bringing the champions to the other champions, like showing the people who are already doing this work that there's others like you who are also kind of trying to pioneer in that space and, and exposing them to each other's work, to each other's efforts, to the kinds of thinking in that space and, and where people are trying to go with this work. So I think even though our grants program didn't really bring them together in, in a specific, we're all gonna do this together kind of way, but knowing that there are other people like you who've also received this kind of funding or also kind of drawing on the same kind of support that you're being given, if you want to bounce off ideas, there's space for collaboration there as well. 
I think it was really helpful in terms of the work that we were trying to do at least. Yeah. That's super interesting. Thank you so much to both of you. That was a real eye opener. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Marta, for the good question. Um, I think it's Mira next. Go over to you, Mira. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, thank you both, uh, Bianca and Glenda. Really inspiring and interesting. And um, I was especially well, inspired to try something um, like the Open Textbook Journeys um, well, a publication you guys uh, produced. And I wonder, who was it aimed at? Uh, did you aim at other open textbook authors who are still to be convinced um, in the necessity or the yeah um, the the need to to publish uh, something like this? Or did you aim at other um, practitioners and researchers like yourself? Uh, who is the intended audience? And if you know, maybe how it is received. Um, by your audience. But I also had a second question that I wanted to ask, and I'll get this up, take this opportunity. Uh, how did you guys manage such diverse, uh, thematically diverse projects uh, technologically? What kind of um, yeah platforms did you use to actually make it happen within one large pilot? Thank you. Bianca, would you like to get the first question? You uh, okay. Um, in terms of audience, we were we wanted to as Linda said, kind of preach to the converted, but really to, to recruit in a way. So it is a, a set of, it was a collection of work where we were trying to show as broad an audience as possible that if this is something that you're interested in, these are the kinds of complexities that are involved in doing this kind of work. So not, we weren't just preaching to um, um, people who already are champions. We wanted to get to people who were also thinking about getting into this people who were maybe had a set of notes sitting somewhere that they thought oh you know it would be nice if I turned this into some kind of handbook or into some kind of um, teaching resource for my classroom but who sit there and think I have no idea how to even start this so it was a, a way of trying to inspire a broad range of people who are at different levels of thinking and development in their work to see what's actually kind of involved in the projects that are currently taking place within their own institution already and what those those the nitty gritties of it the nuances the struggles and what the where the failures are as well um if you once you get a chance to go through them you'll also see that at at the end of each of the um uh journeys each person's journey we also add a section that that shows the the budget so each person, how, how much it costs each person to kind of do this kind of work, what the cost breakdown of the different tasks that they did was and how much money they received from the Dot4D project. So that it's a kind of very practical, very realistic um, showing of what it really takes to do this kind of work. So it, it really was aimed at a very broad audience. It wasn't very specific to everyone, to anyone. I mean. Yeah. Thanks. It's it's really great. And I think the field really needed it also with those practicalities you mentioned, because these are also the questions the authors tend to ask when they come into the this endeavor. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Um, Michelle, are you Michelle? I know Michelle's here, um, our colleague. Um, I don't know if you want to speak about uh, publishing, the, all the different sort of technology publishing um, aspects, Michelle, or do you want me to get that? I'm here. Hi. Hey. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Linda. Yeah, I'll say very quickly, we weren't prescriptive at all in terms of technological approach. And we also were very open in terms of degree of sophistication um, in terms of the initiative. So it wasn't all just about kind of fancy XML publishing and that kind of thing. Although one or two of our authors working in maths and stats did do some interesting work in that area we were really more interested in the processes um, and the work that would go in in, in the course of, of developing the work. Um, in short, uh, the tools were quite basic. A lot of our authors um, authored using Outlook, Office Suite, um, Word, and then Google Workspace, and our institution uses Teams, so those kinds of collaborative environments and people typically produced PDFs um, of different kinds and varieties. So the, the PDF still strongly holds dominance in, in our context, certainly. Um, but then as part of the, the content publishing process, conversion to HTML 
XML, et cetera, where possible. And then using, um, in terms of platforms, we really are trying to promote the use of institutional infrastructure. So using the spaces which Glenda described earlier, such as our institutional repository and our, our open monograph press instance, which is based in the library. So real variance and not an overemphasis from the technology or platform choice from our side. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks. Thanks very much. So I am going to uh, let us um, go into the, the session of the NOL meeting. So I'm going to take these three questions and then I'm going to have to stop so that we have the rest of uh, the meeting. Unfortunately, I would love to continue talking more, but let's just keep it to the, these three questions, but I'm sure you, you're open to, to taking on other questions outside of this meeting. Sure. Um, yeah, but uh, I think the next in line is uh, Jeroen. Yes, hi. Well, uh, thanks, uh, thanks uh, uh, Bianca and Glenda. Uh, that was a very nice presentation, very inspiring. It's a, a great opportunity also perhaps to be able to, to, to borrow some of your ideas as you are obviously so much further down this, down this path than, than we are here in Utrecht. Um, my, my question actually is on, on the range of sort of levels of advancement of the, of the 15 projects that, that, that you have in your, uh, in your community. When these people came in, came into your community or when you, when you first met them, um, did they already have a sort of manuscript or started they really from scratch just with a very vague idea or, or somewhere in between? Um, how was the range of, of that, their advancement? Um, we had a number of people who had course materials already available. They had an idea already available of what they wanted to do. Um, a lot of them. Um, I, out of the 11, I, I can't, I'm not going to give, try and guess an exact number, but, but I would say the majority had work already. Um, and then there were a few that really started from scratch. Um, so that, and, and that's, that's, this was the opportunity for them to actually finish and, and, mm -hmm. public and publish and get that little bit of extra help to actually uh, do the work. So, I mean, that's, you know, one of the things that, that all three of us have been thinking about is what does it actually take? You know, how much money? And how long does it actually take to create a great big open textbook? Um, and you know, it, it's, it's you can't put a number on it. It depends on on the whole process. But we were um, incredibly surprised by, especially those collaborative efforts. I mean, one one of the authors, we were quite worried that he was not going to actually pull it together, and he was quite disappointed because he asked people and they didn't get back to him. And mm. and then. From the next minute, when we came to deadline time, here was this um, amazing uh, piece of work with all these mm -hmm. bits of information from students and little videos from students, and they just managed to pull it together. But because of this intense collaboration that happened, um, so so that was Thank, fantastic. Yeah, thanks so much. And I, I guess none of them previously had sort of published a sort of traditional textbook, or even with a commercial publisher, they were all new to textbooks, or. That's a good question. Um, so they couldn't compare traditional ways. One, with... We definitely had one author who was had open materials, and mm. she wanted to get them published somewhere. And uh, Michelle knows the story a little bit better than I do. But what I understand is that she actually ended up because she wanted it published. The materials were then under a copyright. Mm -hmm. um, so she actually gave, uh, I think I'm correct with that. Um, so, so yeah, she had, uh, I can't think of the others. Others were relatively new at this, I think. Um, yeah. Okay. And Thank we had some you. really yeah. creative, different ways of approaching things, you know, really getting students involved in creating kind of a platform with lots of materials associated with, with the course content. So kind of, a, a, there were definitely looser structures. It wasn't all, all this kind of, it's kind of book idea of chapter, chapter, chapter. Mm -hmm. Very creative ways of approaching it, which which we encouraged. Yeah. Um, That's great to hear. Thanks. Thank you very much, Gemma. To you next. Yes, thank you, Vanessa. Pleased to um, join you today in this meeting because it was a long time 
uh, without coming, but today, of course, it was really, really interesting. And it was very inspiring, this uh, talk, uh, Glenda and, and also Bianca and Michelle also, that she, she was also adding some information about the technical. Um, I would like to ask you something related to um, the students, because in my case, uh, maybe it's not sure, but maybe I have this community that Amata was uh, speaking about before, this key uh, faculty who are working together in a, in a project about open uh, science, and they are engaged in doing some kind of materials, some kind of um, learning materials for a course. So maybe I have uh, like something here, but how can we uh, engage students? This is my first uh, question, because I'm sure that you will have like a lot of experiences. And of course, I will read all these um, uh, study cases of uh, the journeys. But right now, something that you came to your mind, like some recommendation about engaging students. This is my first question. And the second one will be like very logistic. I mean, how do you do the vision of these um, open textbooks uh, on the fly? I mean, during the course, when the course is uh, finished, is there any kind of main coordinator who is, uh, I, don't, I don't know, asking for the deadlines to the authors uh, or maybe trying to join the different texts and videos and images? Um, I don't know if you can recommend me something about this. It will be, um, it will be grateful. Thank you very much. Okay, I, I can try the first part. Maybe Michelle wants to pick up on the second part. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, this is what we're really excited about now is the student co-creation. And so we're interviewing the academics to find out how they did this, how they got students motivated to do this work. And it seems this is, again, there's a range of strategies. So we've, we've, we had one lecturer in architecture who used her whole second year course, class. And every single one of them created, they had to do a building and they had to research a building, they had a little template and all of that went into various range sort of um, drafts of that into a book about um, buildings in the global south. Hmm. So that was that so that was whole class and it was part of the assessment. So that is a strategy. Um, it was part of their marks. Uh, the other lecturer um, in orthopedic surgery also used students made videos and he embedded those videos as part of that. So that was also something that was assessed. Other strategies have been, um, you know, opening it up to the class and see who's interested because, mm -hmm. you know, it often is the case that this is, students are overworked already as they are, we know this. And so whatever work you give them that's extra, it needs to really work, it, it has to kind of, help them in some way obviously and we've we've seen quite nicely students very proud of what they've done afterwards you know it's mm. great to be attributed and to have this publication that they were part of so mm. there is that motivation as well the kind of you know power of publication kind of mm. motivation so there's a range of different things and if you've got students already creating materials it's just a case of of thinking about how you want to put that together and and getting them excited about the fact that the work that they're doing can be published, they can reuse it again, it can be part of their CVs that they've done this thing. Um, they can use it again whenever they need to for any other work that they're doing. Um, so yeah, so it's, but we're we're still thinking it through, but we do have this kind of range that we've seen. I hope mm -hmm. that was helpful. Thank you very much. And Lambert. Uh, yeah, first of all, uh, thank, thanks a lot, Bianca and Glenda. Super interesting. And uh, as Jeron uh, just said, it's also inspiring and it gives us a good starting point, I guess, for some activities um, here in Germany um, from my perspective. And one question that I have, so uh, are there on, on the institutional level certain incentives at play that you've found to be useful so i'm thinking so you uh, uh, mentioned the the award thing which gives additional recognition this okay uh, I, I get this one uh, how about additional funding before the project starts or as it runs 
Is there any other infrastructure uh, that is provided to those projects or other um, ways of yeah, incentivizing or helping them? And if yes, which one is the uh, real, have you been found to be really useful? So resources are always a challenge. Um, and we've we've sort of been quite um, kind of covert in some of our approaches to finding actually existing pots of money where we can make an argument that an open textbook would also be useful. Mm. So we've had teaching innovation grants. And some of those teaching innovation grants have in fact been open textbooks that have been developed. We have now recently curriculum change grants and that we've also now getting what two more textbooks out of that so it's it's kind of a sometimes a case of embedding in something else so let's say somebody's got some research money to to research something but there would also be a related text and so they can get money from that kind of thing but otherwise there isn't anything at the institution that really supports that. We don't have an ongoing rollover fund that helps people, but we do have some of those structures in place. So we have a, me and Bianca and Michelle, and then we've got lots of support from our library in terms of, of, of those places where people can actually publish. So we, we do have support mechanisms along the way, and that is an important part of resourcing, um, but not, not any other kind of funding if you can raise funding somehow that's brilliant thanks Sorry, a lot Gemma we, Gemma we didn't ask answer your second question but I think we've run out of time but uh, please email us just you can always contact us okay great okay so <laughs> thank you once again for really a really inspiring um talk and I'm really keen to go and do some reading and having having a look at some of those journeys and I think there's really heaps to inspire the rest of us so you know um thank you and for all the effort and the resilience that you've had over the years to build this yeah so I think it would be great to continue the conversation and also to know what how your next steps go right. um so thank you again for, so much for coming now we are going to continue with the meeting yes. with the, the general business you you are thank you're you. if you'd like to stay you're welcome but I'm sure you also have other things to do so don't <laughs> feel obliged Okay. Um, yes but th so thank you very much uh, uh thank you okay. thanks everybody thanks bye thanks, so much. thanks a okay. lot see you bye. all again bye, bye. thank bye. you thanks